Welcome to the Washington Tattoo Podcast, where we champion education, celebrate community, and unite the very best of humanity. Fueled by world-class military precision and cultural excellence, Washington Tattoo produces unforgettable immersive experiences, creating an atmosphere for people, organizations, and businesses to connect, network, and build impactful relationships. We invite you to listen to this episode of the Washington Tattoo Podcast, where the world's musical traditions come to life. Thank you so much for joining us. Greetings, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Washington Tattoo Podcast, and we have an incredibly special guest today. Uh, we have our co-host, Stu Warmington, over in the UK. Stu, how is it going today? All good. I suppose we should talk about the weather, as we always do. Uh, when, I, when I went to July, it's still raining. Like, nothing is literally, nothing's changing. You know, six months down, down the road, and the weather's exactly the same, although I did spend two weeks in, or I spent a week in London two weeks ago, and it was red hot. And as I, as I flew back up to up to the northwest, I could just see the rain and the, the mist coming back in, and I landed, and it was it was like I'd never been away. So horrendous. <laughs> That's why I call it the Black Country, mate. You know. <laughs> well, hey, hey, listen, it's it's Wimbledon week. You know, two two weeks. Two weeks. So what do you expect? <laughs> <laughs> well, I love it. Well, so today we have an incredibly special guest. We have Nico McBrain from Iron Maiden, and we just cannot be more grateful, Nico, for your time. So thank you so much for joining us today. It's a pleasure and an honor to be with you both. Thank you so much for having me. Really, yeah. uh, really excited to, I'm excited to hear the, hear the questions because uh, Stu sent me them uh, <laughs> last week. Uh, I don't open them. I don't like to, I like to be put on the spot kind of thing, you know, but uh, anyway, we'll see where we go from there. <laughs> Sounds I'll good. I'll rabbit down a warrant, you know, down its hole. So, you know, <laughs> all over the stuff. <laughs> anyway, lovely to see you both. Uh, Likewise. Right, so, yeah, let, let's get going then, Nick. Let's get straight into it. So, obviously, I've, I've known you for a while now, but what, what I don't know is, is your sort of background. So, and it's one of the questions we ask everybody, and probably the most interesting question we ask everybody is, you know, how did you get started in music and who was your inspiration during that time? Uh, well, it started off, I was about 10 years old and um, I was at home and it was a Monday night. I know that because my father used to do the ironing and, you know, most of us fellas, that's the last thing we want to do, right? Uh, my mum loved my father even more so for that because he, he'd go, oh, it's all right, Rose, I'm going to do the ironing. Monday night uh, in... In 62, there was no live, it was all live TV. And there was a show on, I don't know what the show was, uh, but Dave Brubeck was on. And um, the uh, the drummer Joe Morello did a solo on, mm. uh, you know, they, they had that hit called Take Five. And uh, the, 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 the amazing thing about that was in a 5-4 signature. So it was a very, you know, we all know that. And Joe did this solo and I'm like, I'm sitting in front of this black and white little television Watching, watching Joe go at it, dark sunglasses, you know, and he's giving it all this solo. And bass player did a solo first, then then uh, Joe did his his bit. And I remember I turned to my father and I said, "Who's that? Who's that fella playing with the dark sunglasses?" He said, "Oh, that's Joe Morello, son." I said, "I want to be like him." And he went, "Oh, I'll we'll never be as good as Joe Morello, son." And that with that, I went in the kitchen. And I picked up a pair of knives of, out the cutlery drawer in the kitchen and started to beat the living daylights out of my mum's gas cooker <laughs> and whatever I could make a noise with. And, of course, in those days, the, the cookers were finished with an enamel, uh, a, a, you know, a baked on enamel. Mm. And, and as I'm bashing it with the knives, it's all chipping the enamel off. My mum came in the kitchen. i never forget it. And she goes, ah, she screams, not loud, but ah. <laughs> Harry, she said to my, that's my dad's name was Henry. Harry, get out of here. <laughs> my dad came because he didn't mind me clobbering stuff. You know, it didn't put him off. He was out the ironing. <laughs> and my mum, she's freaked out because there's all these chips of enamel all over the cooker. <laughs> and so my dad came out and kind of mocked clumpy around the, around the back of the head, you know. You know, I think he said something like, um, enough of that. Anything for a quiet life. 
<laughs> you know what I mean one day, and I do now know what he means. When the son upsets the mum, dad usually pays for it, right? <laughs> In more ways than one. So that was the beginning of it. And um, what are you shouting out? Uh, my dog's over. She's blind and deaf, but she's yapping up a storm here. Um, <laughs> So that was the beginning of my journey. And at that time, uh, you know, I had, I had the best, biggest drum set made up, pots and pans and tins and stuff. And I think all drummers that have that, you know, aspiration end up making noise on whatever they can, you know, saucepans mm. and tins and tobacco tins, all kinds of stuff. And I actually took it on the road with me. I took it from my bedroom down to the lounge, the front room at the house one day. It took me about an hour to get all the bits and pieces together. <laughs> so um, I did about an hour a, a year. Uh, I was 10 and a, uh, you know, I played about six, seven months. And on my, the, my 10, I was 10 and a half. Uh, so that would be 1962 Christmas. My mum and dad bought me, bought me a drum set. And it was a John Gray Broadway kit, three piece. Little little symbol on a sucker on the bass drum. Tom Tommy had a you know had a, had a bracket that you you had to clip to the the hoop of the bass drum, and I took that on a road. I did that went on and did a couple of gigs with me. My first gig was in a place called Russell Vale School of Dancing, and um, um we did because my mum made me do ballroom dancing. Car couldn't do the foxtrot now or the can can. I don't know. I mean. <laughs> Get the can can. <laughs> anyway, I couldn't do it when I was 12, let alone that, uh, you know, my age. Anyway, so um, that was the beginning. And so I, I asked to my mum and dad to buy it for the, the, bought that first drum set for me. And I was hooked and um, just carried on from there. My influences uh, were uh, the, the wonderful, great, and he's still with us, Ringo Starr. Mm. Um, and uh, unfortunately, Charlie Watts, unfortunately, as we all know, is not with us. Um, so those two guys were really ins ins inspirational to me in my early days, da in those beginning days. And then, of course, <laughs> the great, wonderful Keith Moon came along and mm. just blew my mind. And I thought, I, I think these those four molded my st my style of playing. Although I, I'm. You know, I, I, I'm not playing pop music, but, you know, that was my my early days of learning, doing cover versions of all kinds of songs, your know, soul songs, blues songs. Uh, I later, I did have a love for, for blues, but uh, that was a, when I was about 14, 15 years old, I joined a blues band called Wells Street Blues, Wells Street Blues Band, W-E-L-L-S. And um, so then after that, uh, we had the, the, the wonderful John Bonham come along and I was just, you know, I was blown away with Keith mm. and I'm like, you know, who is this guy? And then of course Led Zeppelin hit the, hit the scene and John Bonham just blew my mind. And uh, I think having got that influence as, a, his, as he has his playing, that's why I'm like a, a single bass run player. Because hmm. uh, that's what that was, you know, he had this incredible right foot and he was doing triplets on the bass drum, which was unheard of and um, unheard of. Oh, there's a little pun in there. Anyway, um, <laughs> but it wasn't unheard, was it? Hey, <laughs> think about it. So, um, so that was it. That was that was the beginning of, of my journey. Um, my mother and father and my sister, they were really supportive of me. And, and, and my, I remember my father said, one day, uh, you know, I, I had the opportunity to go kind of more semi-pro than pro uh, with a band. And I was 16 years old. And, uh, he, you know, he said, mum said, no, you need to get a trade. I said, well, music is a trade, mum. And my old man said, it's a bit of a fickle business, son. You need something to fall back on. Just go. Mm -hmm. So uh, I ended up doing a, a degree in um, mechanical engineering, uh, not mechanic motor cars in england mm -hmm. mechanical is like working um metal work metal, metal uh, machining you know lathing milling all that kind of stuff and i did an architect course and to do technical drawing so i did that uh, and um i did that for four years i did one day a week two nights they called it an indenture in england it wasn't an apprenticeship um and it was uh, uh, southgate technical college i went to for four years and um, i'll pass my exams I've uh, had the final result, and funny enough, and no, I don't believe in coincidences. I, mm. I believe that the good Lord has a plan for you. And um, I came home from work. I'd given my job up 
and I was going pro with these two songwriters, a guy called Mike Leslie and Billy Day. And I, I, I got home and um, my mum was like surprised to see me walk through the door at half past two in the afternoon. And she started to say, you know, what are you doing home? And I'm like, well, as it happens, mum. Oh, she said, hang on a minute. This came for you. And I had a letter from the City and Guilds Institute, which was the final result. And I've opened it. Mm. And she, my mum was like really excited more than I was. <laughs> I said, go on, open it, open it. And I opened it. And, and you know, she, I said, oh, I'll pass with honours. Oh, she said, that's great. Oh, wait, what are you doing home? I said, well, funny enough, mum. Um, and this is bizarre. I mean, it was the same day. I'd given me a job up. And I was going to tell mum and dad without having the result knowing that I'd got that result, that I had, had jacked me job in uh, and I was working for a company called Zales making cup generator anonometers. Mm -hmm. uh, if you lot don't know what that is, it's a wind and temperature measuring device that weather stations were using. Unfortunately, I had to work with a lot of mercury for, and I was very careful with that. But anyway, so I, uh, my mum's going, she, she, she started to get on my case. She said, what are you doing? I, I said, well, as it happens, mum, See this? She said, I said, I'm going pro with, the, with, with Billy and Mike. She said, you wait. I said, yes, I am. She said, you wait till your father gets home. <laughs> <laughs> so I was living at home with my mum and dad when I was 21. So uh, that was that was the beginning of my professional career. So, um, uh, yeah, 1973, I went pro. So, you know, I, I, I owe it to my mum and dad for their, their wonderful support. And uh, I didn't get a clump around the ear like I expected to off of dad. He was all, oh, yeah. this is your first gig, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Incredible. That's amazing. It's funny when you talk about how you started on the pots and pans, because I think so many of us are the same way. Absolutely. Uh, I grew up in New York and it was the same thing. Started playing on the pots and pans as a kid on the floor. My parents are tripping over them, trying to make food, stubbing their toe on the corner. Mark, what is you doing? What are you doing? Oh, really? uh, but the thing was, so my mom, she, she used to do a lot of knitting and crocheting and stuff. So she had these crochet needles, which were quite thick. They were almost like a 2A stick, you know, and, and wow. I'd nick them. And of course, I wasn't bashing the, the living daylights out, you know, it wasn't too heavy. Mm -hmm. uh, and then she had these metal nickel needles, which I, you used to get a better sound. If you turned them around and the, there was a little knob on the end of the needle, you know, they were about <laughs> a foot long, 12, 14 inches long. And I'd be using those and <laughs> she'd be, she, you know, I'd nick it out of it, whatever she was <laughs> knitting. And I didn't realize how it messed her up. And she'd go, wait, okay, she called me Michael when I was in trouble. Mm -hmm. Instead of Nikki, which was where my Nico came from. Uh, Got it. Got it. I love it. Can't get it. Anyway, so uh, she'd shout up the stairs, Nikki, where's my needles? Another club round of luck, I was coming. Yeah, Amazing. Yeah, uh, yeah we, we all did it, didn't we? And, and um, yeah, it, it, those little metal tips made a better sound off the tins. I love it. I love it. So going from playing on the pots and pans and going semi-pro and then somehow you you make it to this incredibly iconic legendary band, Iron Maiden. How did that all happen? Uh, well, they, you know, again, I, I believe the good Lord works works in everyone's lives, whether you're a believer or not. You, you don't have to believe if you don't want to. But I do believe this. He puts people in your life along your route. And uh, it, it's the old saying is, it's who you know and where you are at that time, you know. And anyway, so rather than get deep into that, I was um, I was, I was playing in a three-piece band called McKitty. And um, that was back in 1978, 79. A guy called Neville Roberts, wow. dear friend of mine, used to manage it. And uh, it all fell about after a couple of years. But... Um, we did a show in Belgium and it was an indoor festival and um, Judas Priest was supposed to be headlining and Iron Maiden were second on the bill and it was their very first uh, in, 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 they'd never been out of England before 1979 and uh, so we were on the same bill and we would, we were doing our set we were on like late afternoon i can't remember how, how many other bands were before us or after us i think we might have been on uh the, a bad two bands before maiden anyway so um 
my dog's yapping up a storm again. <laughs> uh, so um, we're on stage, and Donovan, so Donovan was McKitty was a guitar player. Charlie Toomer hired a bass player, and myself. Donovan's gear broke down, and Maiden loaned us an amplifier from their back line, which was great because um, we didn't carry any spares or anything like that. I mean, we were just, uh, you know, we had what we had. And so then after that, I, I, so the day before, I should just digress a minute and go backwards. The day before, we all met in, um, uh, I can't remember the name of the town now. Um, it was out of, out, not, it wasn't in Brussels, it was outside. And we were walking, me, Donovan, and Charlie. To, we had a, we actually went to the gig in a green Rolls Royce, right? So, <laughs> so that that freaked people out. And we had a we had a photographer friend of ours with us called George Bodnar. So the three of us were were in the back of the car. George was up front. We were never all driving. So anyway, we that well, that was a big talking point when we got the hotel. Everyone's who is this? Who is that man that just got out that roller? <laughs> so, <laughs> Bit of touch of the high life before we even started, you know. Anyway, we get to we, we went out that afternoon and went to the local town square where all the maiden guys were, not knowing that, but we were walking and I had this white suit on and a, and a fedora hat. And uh, Steve to this day reckons he said it was quite a sight because Donovan was like six foot three tall and I, you know, so he was taller than me. Charlie Tuma High was about five eight, five nine. And he was an Aboriginal guy, right, mm. in colour. So I uh, had two black fellas and me with this hat on. And <laughs> when, when Steve saw us walking across the square towards the cafe where the, all the maiden guys were, he thought I was a pimp. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you, it was hilarious. So anyway, we met and, and we made really good friends with that, with, with maiden. And I knew Rod Smallwood, who was their manager at that time, and still is. So Rod and I have history. We go back to 1976 when we first met. But that's another story. Um, so um, we're doing we're doing this. Uh, so we, when Donovan's amplifier blew up, or whatever it happened, he just conked out. Charlie and I, we were halfway through a song, so we looked at one another. We're just we're just playing, and Donovan's trying to get his amp working and there's nothing coming out of it. And, it, and, and I said to Charlie, solo. So we didn't stop. So Charlie went off and did a bass solo. Of course, what happens after the bass solo, boys and girls, we yeah. all know that, don't we? It should be the other way around, really. Then you can all bugger off to the bar and have a beer. <laughs> when the bass solo comes along. <laughs> so anyway, he does his bit. I do my bit. And we had this incredible jam going while they, they fixed that and swap the head out on the, the amplifier. Uh, and uh, so Harry, who still to this very day, if you look at it, when we got the support band or your special guests to Maiden shows, if you look stage left or stage right for you lot looking at the stage, you'll see Steve Harris. Every gig, he'll come up and he may be, he may be stays and watches the whole show or he'll watch half of it. Mm. But he always, always stands on the side and watches. Uh, more, more times than, than not, if, we, if if I need to see Steve for something, I know where to find him. He'll be watching yeah. the support act. And it doesn't happen to be, you know, one of his, his siblings in the band. It can be anybody. Incredible. Anyway, so um, he's watching this go down. And he remembered that he doesn't like drum solos or bass solos. And to be very honest with you, at that time, I was okay with them. Because it was a traditional thing in the 70s that, that bands would do bass guitar solos, guitar solos on their own. The guitar players go up front on his own and then the mm -hmm. drummer, whatever. So it was a kind of a, a stable diet of, of what you, to, you could expect. Anyway, after that, he remembered that, um, that night or that after, late afternoon of me and Charlie doing this solo together. And he was suitably impressed. So when things didn't go too well for Clive, you know, three years later, he, uh, he, immediately, he immediately thought of me to replace Clive. So um, that was it. That's how I got Maybe. the gig. Um, and it was really on the back of being in the right place at the right time. 
you know, and I, I, I didn't really audition. Um, there's another backstory to what happened in 1982 with me as I was employed from July. And I, at that time, I'd, I'd moved on from McKitty and was working in a, in a French bank called Trust. And uh, it's funny, and I got fired from Trust in 1980, uh, sorry, 1982. My last show I played with them was on my birthday of 1982 at the Rock Palace show, uh, supporting mm. Golden Earring. And um, two weeks later, I get a phone call from Bobby Bruno, their manager, and he goes, hey, Mr. McRae, you call? And they're French, by the way, just in case you didn't recognise the accent. Here's uh, it's Bobby Bruno on the phone. I said, hello, Bobby, what's up? He said, I ain't got some bad news. I said, what's that then? Yeah, he said, you, 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 you're fired. We'd have to lay you off. I went, you what? He said, we have got no more money. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how he spoke. He was a really weird geezer. Uh, so two weeks after that, I get a phone call from, from Rod. Um, said, to, uh, said to me, uh, you know, Clive wasn't doing so well. Steve was uh, asking me to ask you if you would like to join the band. So wow. that was it. And they, they put me on a retainer. And uh, three times I went through that with them. Uh, you know, I, I was on a retainer. Then I'd have to meet Andy Taylor, one of our manage the other manager. Uh, we have we have quite a team at the minute, but the main two guys are Rod Smallwood and Andy Taylor. And uh, we would meet in a pub. The first time I met Andy, we, 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 were, in a, <laughs> we were in a pub at the back of the Gray's Inn Road uh, up in Islington. And... Um, uh, he turned around, we, we met at one o'clock and it, it was like a drug deal going down. But it wasn't drugs, <laughs> it was an envelope with money in because they put me on a retainer and they gave me a month up front. So Andy gets it, he puts his envelope out of his pocket under the table. <laughs> <laughs> I'll never forget that either. Anyway, so that was the beginning of my, my journey with Maiden. And uh, my first downbeat with them was January the 9th, 1983. Amazing. And uh, I met a few times, and because what happened during that six months or five months that I was employed, and then I wasn't, I oh, well, then they put me back on, and then I again it happened, and the third time was when it was the final time, and I was told to seek, I had to swear to secrecy, not tell a soul, and uh, I had an opportunity to do an album with Gary Moore because uh, we were great mates, and. Uh, <clears throat> The Who were looking for a drummer, and I was like, oh, my gosh, I could go join the Who. Uh, not that I knew I'd get the gig if I went, but, you know, that was so. That was how I ended up meeting Maiden. Wow. So, you crazy. don't get a short story with me, lads, so no. <laughs> I think we've realised that. We're only, we're only two questions in. <laughs> well, no, better get going then. Let's make this a yes or no question. <laughs> Who's a good-looking bloke in the band? Well, that's obvious. <laughs> Well, you know, we, we've gone on from your, you know, your adventure from pots and pans through to possibly playing in the Who, but definitely carried on with Maiden. Uh, yeah. So now you're living in the USA. How did how did that transition happen? What what made you end up living in in the US? And what do you miss most about the UK? Obviously, not the weather. That's for oh sure. well, it used to be it used to be sausage rolls and and a pint of uh, Abbot Ale. But being I've been teetotal for nine years, strike the last. Um, so I, I met my wife, uh, current wife, I say current cause I've been through the mill twice. Um, we met in Fort Lauderdale when we started rehearsing, uh, peace of mind album. So I'd recorded a piece of mind. My first wife and I, we were, we were, we were strange. It was, it was, it was not working for us. Anyway, I met Rebecca, uh, and then I fell in love with her. She came out to the studio. I, we, 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 I didn't see her for years. So we first met in 83. Then I wrote her a Dear John note on the bullet train in Japan, you know, trying to reconcile with my first wife. Uh, and then when we were recording Power Slave, I got a letter from her mum saying, this is what my daughter looks like now with a picture of her, you know, and... Um, it had been almost almost a year, and uh, I, I phoned her, you know, and I had a phone number on it, and I called her back up, and I because it, it wasn't working with my first wife, and um, I called her up, and she came out in the Bahamas when we were doing Power Slave, and that was it. So then we moved to London for a, a year and a couple of years, and she didn't really like it, 
uh, and she she found it difficult to, you know to to kind of adjust to to the English way of life. So uh, as she said, I, I don't want to move back to the states. I said, well, okay, I'll do that on one condition. She said, what's that? I said we go to Florida because I fell in love with Florida while we were rehearsing here and. Um, I spent a week here, we were on tour and I got a splinter in my finger and I was digging it out mm. and it turned septic and I had <clears> blood poisoning <throat> and I, my hand had swollen up and we were up in Canada uh, later. Uh, it was uh, towards the end of the Power Slave, I think it was a Power Slave tour. Anyway, I had to have, I had to have a week off and I came back to Florida and uh, in fact, it was it was peace of mind. So I fell in love with the, with 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 America and, and, you know, Florida, especially. So we moved here in 19, 1989. And uh, that was how that's how that happened. But uh, I miss my, my sister, obviously, then my mum was still alive and my father. Well, actually, no, um, my mum, my father, I lost my father in 85. But my mum was still alive. So I miss my family. That was really, you know, that was really the, uh, a wrench. But you know, I was making a little bit more money, and so I could afford to fly backwards and forwards. So that wasn't too much of a yeah. problem. Yeah, um, you know, I, I my, my, one of my very dearest friends was Jim Marshall. So when you know, I was coming back to see him and hang out and have that. But yeah, that's primarily what I miss. On top of not not sausage sandwiches, is the bread. The bread over here honestly sucks. <laughs> it really, it, it really ain't that great. Um, you know. But you know, I do miss a good sandwich. Um, hey, that's it, really. Oh, miss, I miss my mates. You, yeah. You've got the weather, so that, that that's a, a more than compensates for the sausage sandwiches. Hence, I'm 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 on Floridian mode. Floridian mode, as you can <laughs> shirtless boys and girls. I do have pants on. Look, <laughs> they're me scuzz pants. Yes, and they're not pajamas. They're chef <laughs> pants. Just show you lot know. <laughs> oh, I love it. So you've traveled all over the world, Nico, and there's had to be some incredible stories. Are there ones that stand out more than others with your travels? Oh, blimey, that's a good question. Well, you know what? There's there's so many of them, you know, as you say, um, it's hard to choose. I mean, the, 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 the most incredible thing is every show is different with Iron Maiden. And I say that, and you know, you get the same set. And the reason we we don't swap them out, swap a song, go oh, sure, let, let's do uh, let's do bring your daughter to the slaughter. No thanks, uh, mm. anyway, yeah. or a song is because the way the lights are, are programmed. Even when we didn't have those computer desks now that you have, where you plug a flipping USB yep. put the thingy in it, and everything works. It's all there, you know. Um, so it's, it's doing the shows. I mean, you, you know, it's. Uh, there's no rule. I can't really recall at, at the moment being put on the spot. I mean, but my, my main thing that I take away is when I get to the shows is is how each show is different. The audience the reactions are slightly different every night. And it's the, it, for me, you know, boys and girls, you think you, you think I can't see you, but I can. I mean, I've, <laughs> I've raised my stool a little bit, lowered my drum set. In the old days, I'd sat about, I'd sit on a beer crate. That's how come I sit so low, because I used to do pubs and clubs and, and you know, I didn't have a stool, so I'd use a beer crate. And wow. that's, that's a, you know, I'm, it's pretty much, well, you can't see, but, you know, it's, it was only like a really low, and, and my kit was all up here. You mm -hmm. couldn't see it. I mean, the rest of the band loved that. They were like, oh, yeah, you can't see the best <laughs> bloke in the band girls, you know. <clears throat> now you can. <laughs> anyway, um, it's doing the shows, mate. Uh, they're, they're all so, it, it, you know, and, and my greatest memory of, of probably the show, the first show I did at Rock in Rio, there was over 300,000 kids in that audience. And wow. it was the first Rock in Rio back in 85. And, um, yeah, we were firing up. I mean, we were on the, we were on the, on the power slate tour and we, we we took a couple of like a four or five days off to able to you know we were up in new york i think we flew Ari varig airlines first class from new york to brazil because it's like 14 hours or 13 hour flight i mean you don't realize how far away it is yeah, yeah. and um so we flew first class i remember that because we had a they, they served you fresh boiled up lobsters oh it was nuts uh, it was proper first class back in 85. I mean, proper first class, right? And uh, we, were, we were all like, 
loading it up. Yeah, we were in first class. <laughs> and then we did the show. We, I think we got there the day before. And then we did the show. And then we the next day, I think we had off. And then we flew back and start, picked up the, the North American tour. Wow. We're walking out on that stage. Uh, and we were special guests to, to Queen. We didn't hit the stage till like one o'clock in the morning. And wow. we'd been there since like two o'clock the afternoon before. And uh, it was crazy. Uh, and I walked out and I remember I stood behind the drum kit. As I, as I got up on the kit, I looked out and th th there was a wave of arms. People were like giving it this mm -hmm. you know, before we got on, before we went on stage. And, they, they, you know, I, I forget what intro tape we had going at the time. It might have been Ace's Eye. I can't remember. And uh, that I looked out and it was like a sea, just a sea. You couldn't see your individual faces. I, maybe a hundred yards away you could make out somebody smiling or looking at you because it was quite dark as well. And it was it was like, oh, dear. Yeah. <laughs> All those people. <laughs> Sorry, boys and girls, I'm being rude. Yeah. But it was it was magical. It was a great gig. And I remember Bruce, we were playing Power Slave and uh was it power slave one of the songs in the set anyway and he, he, he had this guitar and bless his heart he couldn't really play it you know but he looked good and he, <laughs> he, he pulled it off and he whacked his head and he cut his head oh no uh, i think or, or maybe he tripped over and hit, hit the monitor he, as he was taking the guitar off to give it i think he fell over and he came back on stage and i, I didn't see this it was only on the film later that i saw it and, and then late after the gig he's got this cut on his head and Rod apparently turned around and said, can you do that every gig? It looks really good. <laughs> <laughs> He's got Clara coming down his face. So that was that was probably the most memorable gig for me. Wow, that, that's an amazing memory to have, to have you with you on your travels. Uh, so I want to bring it more up to recent times now, Nico. And I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but the start of 23 is when you, you suffered a, a TIA, which obviously affected yeah. uh, a side of your body. Uh, so I just want to know how how that affected your playing and what sort of therapy you went through to then get you ready for the next maiden tour, which obviously wasn't too far, you know. No, for you. it was. It happened on January the nineteenth last year, and um, you know when I when I I, I I was actually having cataract surgery that day, and I guess there was a lot of stress and and, and angst, you know. You know, with somebody messing with your peepers, and I was getting them both done at the same time. Mm. In the old days, they'd do one at a time just in case it didn't work. You know, you'd be walking around blind in one eye, not both. And that's the only reason I, I had it on good authority. That's the only reason they don't like to do, to even today, both at the same time. But I had, you know, I had confidence in the in the surgeon with the, with the way they do it nowadays. And I said, oh, can I get done both at the same time? Yeah, no problem. Anyway, so I, 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 just, I remember I was watching some tennis. I love the old tennis. And I was watching tennis on the telly. I was up at 6 o'clock in the morning, which is unusual for me because that was usually an hour. I, I get up about 7, 7.30 nowadays. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> I got up and I was a little bit anxious. And I, I laid on the chaise lounge and I went to sleep. About eight o'clock, I thought, oh, I'm going to have a nap. I feel really tired. And I woke up about 45 minutes later, and, and I'd, had this, I'd had this stroke. And I thought it was pins and needles, you know, but I couldn't feel all the pins and needles. I'm, I'm, I picked my arm up going, what's going on here? I can't. And I could feel, I'd say, I said, touch. But nothing was happening. My, my hand was like this, kind of, you know, when I, anyway, I'd, and I'm going, and I let my arm go, and it just dropped. And I went, oh, shit. Something ain't right here. And it, 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 it didn't paralyze my leg, although my leg was wobbly, which was a good thing because my foot still worked. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, at least one saving grace, God gave me my right foot without, you know, it's, it's not quite as good as it was. But anyway, I went to the doctors and or they took me to the hospital, had a whole team of people work around me. That was absolutely, it was like I was a superstar. And they didn't know who I was. You know, that's the, that's the sort of treatment that everybody gets when they have a stroke and they go to the, the Boca Baptist Hospital, Boca Regional. Uh, they have a crew of like 12 people around you instantly. do not matter who you are. And uh, so after the MRI, they did a CT scan and I went to an MRI. And um, I, I came out my, my uh, 
Swerdloff, my, my neurologist doctor, he had a plethora of students around him. And uh, he had about six kids, young ones. I, I call them kids. So, I mean, they're probably all 20s in their 30s or whatever. Anyway, he goes, oh, you, you, you've had a stroke, Mr. McBrain. I went, yeah, tell me something I don't know. And he laughed, you know. And uh, he said, um, it's, a, it's a TIA. I said, okay, um, so it's not a major stroke. He said, yeah. He said, uh, we've got this drug called TNK, which what it stands for, I've no idea. Hmm. And he said, it's a clock buster, and it prevents any further damage being done to your brain that may have or what well, has already occurred. He said, uh, but there's a, side, there's, a, there's a risk. And I said, what's the risk? He said, you could die. Hey. <laughs> I went, okay. So what's the percentage of, of, of failure from people having this? He said, eight to... Uh, eight, was it seven to nine percent people? He says, So, if you have it, we have to put you in intensive care for 24 hours and monitor you every hour. And I went, Well, well okay, let's have it. He says, Sign here. And I'm right handed, so I had to put a cross. Wow, <laughs> it could, it would a cross do. And he said, Just make out as much as you can. I sort of squiggled an M and a line, gave it to me outside the MRI uh, about. Three hours later, I'm upstairs, uh, and I, I finally, I, I, I could move my thumb a little bit. At the first thing I could move, and then, then I, then I went into the next day. Um, I was in for two nights, and uh, the next, the, the day after I got out, I went for therapy, and I had three physiotherapies, or I had three physiotherapies uh, a, a week, and OT, occupational therapy. Uh, the, the, the physical therapy, because my scapula had dropped and apparently my face was down here. Uh, although I could talk, I, I, you know, so the only thing I had was the paralysis. So uh, it took me three months of intense, you know, and the first three months of a stroke uh, is where you have the most recovery. After that, the next three months, it's a little less. And then the three months after that and so on and so forth. I'm over a, a, almost a year and a half now. Uh, well, it will be in, a, in next week. In next week, what's the date? Yeah, ten days time. So I am. I, I'm still not back to where I want to be. I, I've probably got. I can't do. I can't do. So if this is a tempo, I can't do a 16 note roll going into 30 second note rolls anymore. It, it, what happens is I can play eight notes. You know, like that, 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 that kind of groove. I can do doubles, but I can't. When I when I try and play that 16th at that speed, it, it kind of, instead of going up and down, it wobbles from left to right mm. when I start playing fast, when I try to play the fast. So I've had to adjust my feels now. I mean, I don't play the trooper feel anymore because I can't get it. it the first, that, 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 that. It's the, it, it, it's the speed of it. I can do everything slow. Right. But, you know, I've had to make sure that as long as I can keep the groove of the song, which is normally, you know, it's, you know, I'm going to just play fours on that for the trooper. You know, instead of that sort of thing, that, that gallop on the ride. Right. So um, the band, you know, have, have been really great. I mean, Steve was saying, uh, you know, when I first told them like last year, uh, you know, we had the rehearsal starting in April, end of April. So I had that three months, March, February, March, April. I had 12 weeks of recovery, basically, before I went and had rehearsal. And um, so today my routine now is I, I do the eight on eight to warm up and try and get my fingers working. But they're not, it, it, you know, I'm at the stage now where I've kind of I've peaked. I've noticed... And some of the rehearsals I play with the Titanium Tart Band I've got, which are doing the same set that I'm playing with Maiden later in the uh, late in uh, this year. Uh, we're doing exactly the same set. Got a couple of gigs coming up this weekend. Um, you know, we rehearse once a week. We've got two. I've got rehearsal tonight and tomorrow, so I'm allowed to be able to try these things out, and they're not working. Mm. So I've, I've got reverted back to what I was doing with the band last year. Which was playing straighter on on those kind of fields. Fear of the dark. I'm I'm getting the triplets again, and and a couple of the hi hat snaps, those kind of things. It's all about the tempo of the songs. When they're fast, I have a struggle. When they're slow, I can do it. 
Yeah. Right, right. Well, it's an interesting because uh, we were first talking about the possibility of meeting one another at London's Royal Albert Hall with yeah. the bands of the Royal Marines. And this was a couple of years back and Stu had kind of shared, you know, that, you know, something had happened, but he couldn't really share exactly what it was that happened. So for you being open and sharing your experience with us is really, I mean, it's powerful. And I'm with you, my brother. I believe God puts us on this planet for the right reasons with the right purpose. And you re you meet great people and, ma and magic happens. And I felt like over the last couple of years, it's been something for me that I really, I really wanted to meet you. I wanted to hear your story. And so, I mean, this podcast is really special for us. And Stu and I have been talking about, you know, how our connections with, you know, the U.S. Army, the Royal Marines, and how music can really help and shape, you know, culture. It can, and it can shape your brain. It can shape how you think. Yeah. Uh, and so, like, I think Stu's got a question for you just about how it all worked together when we finally got that to all happen this past year in London. Yeah. 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 So, yeah go ahead, Stu. Yeah. So obviously I know what happened and, and Mark saw the, the sort of the, the end uh, finished product, but you know, do you just want to chat about the process from, you know, going in and with, with the, with the drummers on the Sunday, right the way through the rehearsals with the band and then, uh, and then to the, the polished performance at the end. Yeah. Well, you know, obviously, as as Mark was, was saying, saying, we I, it was planned to do this in 2023 um, uh, or 2022, rather. I'm, I beg your pardon. And uh, you know, I was, you know, it was something that none of us got, could have foreseen what happened to me. I mean, only God knows has that plan. And and you know, I still, you know, digressing a little bit, I asked myself whether it was the way God was saying to me, he wants me to hang it up. And I still, I still pray to him every day about that. You know, is it, is it something, is this still what you want me to do? You know, there's, you know, why did I have a stroke? Well, I know why I was under a lot of stress and there was a lot of things going on in my life at that time, because medically my doctor, he, he asked me, he said, why do you think you had that stroke? I said, well, maybe it was my blood pressure. You, your blood pressure is fine. You've had that because I had a medical like yeah. six weeks prior to it. I said, well, high cholesterol, bad cholesterol. As you know, no, you're you you you're all within your limits, Nick. He said, there's nothing wrong with that. Your heart's good. I had an angiogram a year ago, or, or a year prior to having the stroke. So we knew I was okay physically in terms of what normally, what kind can, can you know, what's the symptoms behind a, a TIA. And the, the, the other killer of it all is stress. And I said, well, I, I think it must be it's down to stress then. You know, I, there was a couple of things that happened in my life that, that made me. It's, I got robbed. My house got broken into while I was on tour oh, uh, no. in, in 22. Anyway, that, that, that's it. So when uh, I was asked to do the Mountbatten Festival, I was like, as you know, Stu, it was like, Oh, this is this is something you know. This is great. I am so happy to be able to do this. And then, of course, the TIA took over, and uh, it was postponed for that year. Um, and then we would we, we we did it this year. So um, I was very grateful for not being dropped from the the idea. And the guy said, "No, well, let's do it next year, and you have got a year for recovery, and we'll see how you get on." So you know, having worked so hard getting myself together for for the maiden tour which started off shaky it ended up a lot stronger than it started off at but um i kind of uh, you know I, I i i was so excited to do it so of course when i came over to england to start rehearsals with the band and uh i think we started the drumline rehearsals on the sunday <laughs> yeah. i had this dodgy solo worked out uh, and it was different to one I'd been playing at home that I'd worked out. But it basically was an eight-bar solo. It started off with one one hat lift, bah, doof, ba, doof, ba, doof, ba, two, two, trying to keep the time and keep it more simple, bath, bath, rather than being flaring up and trying stuff that I knew wasn't going to work. Second bar, two accents, lifts on the hat. Third bar, three accents. Fourth bar, four another bar and we're out you know yeah. <laughs> and do we end on the downbeat or on the one you know uh, uh oh, yeah we're down, you know or, or the push so um i remember when the drum guys they had, they had all these marks on the floor in this gymnasium and they all the drum line guys and girls because they, they were i think there were four ladies uh drummers in the line and um the the one was one girl 
um, I forget her name now. She she was the one who worked out this particular solo that the drummers were playing. It was, it was really great. She was a massive Iron Maiden fan. And she was really, like, oh, really? you know. Anyway, I did this, I was playing this horrible solo and then we worked it out and, and it, 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 it kind of came together. And then the next day was rehearsal with the orchestra. <laughs> that was something else. So we moved from the gymnasium uh, to the Portsmouth Naval Base. And they had this sport, sport, sportatorium, if you like, with a climbing wall. And it was really ambient. And, and on all the, all the guys with the PA systems and stuff, well, they didn't need a PA, uh, with the 90-piece orchestra. So I got the drum set. And I thought, why am I doing this complex, trying to do this complex complexity, if you like, mm -hmm. solo? Let's go back to the one you worked out at home. So when it was time to start, I, I, I played it on my own and, and, and I said to, to uh, Ian Davis, the conductor, I said, here, Ian, what do you think of this? And I played it again. He went, oh, that sounds great. I said, I'm going to do it. So I got the drum line guys. I said, right, I've changed the solo. And they went, okay, nobody gave me any grief about it. And, and it worked. And it, it, it's not the greatest bit of playing in the world. But it's it it was it was the the energy of the moment for me, and uh, we, so Ian, we we started to kick off uh, the you know da 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 the Aces High intro right, and I remember sitting in front of the kit. I'm at the kit. I'm getting really nervous now because it's like is the, is is the show. <laughs> Yeah, and I just heard this orchestra behind me because I've never sat in front of an orchestra like that in my life. It's the first time, and I just went, "Holy moly!" And I had this goosebumps on my whole of my body, and I just stood up and I put my head round the gong and went, and Ian's sort of like, you know, skidded it that that right, and he he looked at me and he, and he just stopped. I went. What do you stop for? He said, because you're standing behind me. I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> so everybody had a laugh. And um, and then he went, oh. Uh, so we ran through that. And then he said, oh, he said, I've got an idea. So you see what you think of this? And he got the orchestra to, to do this swell up. Because we're going to have the, we have, we had the Winston Churchill speech with the Spitfires and stuff. Actually, so we didn't have that there, but he said, This is imagine this is the film's playing. And I went, Yeah, okay, and they swell up and the orchestra swelling and uh, bam, <laughs> that. Right? I'm like, Holy, and I, I got that same feeling on the Saturday when uh, the, the Friday performance was pretty good, but you know, the Saturday one was just I thought was, was probably the best one out of the lot. The magic in the room, and it was such a great experience of playing with like 32 drummers and you know uh, uh, when we did the dress rehearsal i remember um I can't, I'm, I'm, I'm terrible with names so just please forgive me the lady that was running the stage backstage um she said what are you going to wear i said i'm going to wear one of those shirts the royal marines royal navy shirt right and she wore oh, i don't know if i can get you one of those i said well okay she said you got any other ideas? I said, well, I think I was thinking of putting a, a, a suit on. She said, that will do. Mm -hmm. So the, that, the, the, the dress rehearsal on a Thursday, I put this white three-piece suit on and a white shirt. <laughs> and, of course, I come out and I'm thinking, what am I going to I can't play in this jacket. It's, it's bad enough playing with the handicap. Handicap, boys and girls, get it? Mm -hmm. anyway, so um, I had to take my jacket off and hang it up on the golf stand. <laughs> of course, when I left, after the first performance, I forgot my jacket. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it was magic. It was such an amazing experience. It really was. And one, that, that's, you know, you asked me about, b before about my experiences touring with Maiden. I think that was the highlight for me for two reasons. I'd always wanted to play the Royal Albert Hall before I was 25 years old. And I, I thought, that's it. Once I've done that, making that a long playing album, I've made it. And I can hang it up. And go do do my engineering yeah. work, you know. And I'd never. It's taken fifty years for me to play the Albert Hall. <laughs> Unbelievable. I and I and I I love that you're bringing this up because honestly, that was giving back to the service members with the Royal Marines and being a part of something so so much bigger than us individually. And I think 
you know, hearing the story about the rehearsal and hearing the story about how everything was happening from the rehearsal to the performance, I was blown away and I was incredibly grateful to Stu and the British Drum Company team that was there that really helped, you know, put that all together. So, Stu, thank you for all of that. Yes, my uh, my, my hat's off to you, Stu, Stu, Stu for that. Um, you know, it was such an, uh, an amazing, you know, the way the journey to get there. You know, you know, it was it was very very shaky at the beginning. I didn't even know if if I could play with Maiden and, and, and carry that on. But to be able to come to the Albert Hall with these guys and and, and a lot of them were fans, and uh, to to be able to, you know, show uh, and, and the legacy, uh, the legacy kit that was built, you know, um, by BDC and Stu. Uh, you know, thank you for setting it. it was you know, Stu is our our marching guy, in the, as we, we as we know, and uh, it was really down to you, Stu, to, to, for the introduction to bring myself and Rebecca to the the show back in twenty two, and um, it, it was just a, an amazing experience. I, this is this is one of those experiences away from Maiden that I will never forget. I will take this this to the grave with me. And uh, I, I, my hats off to all the uh, the be people behind. I mean, it's all service people that work the show, as well, which is fascinating. The sound, the lights, the stage production, the way they set it all up, the different or orchestral uh, conductors. You know, it's just it was some, such a great uh, event to be in, you know, be a part of. And I, I thank you, and I, I I'm really in gratitude to you, Stu, for that. That's mate. all right. We, we, we've been talking about your. Uh, you know, me memories and favourite bits. But I I've got a couple from that show myself. And one of them was the dress rehearsal when you first came out with your white suit on. And obviously the band weren't expecting this because Nick had his, oh, chef's yeah. had his chef's pants on all week. So everybody just presumed it was going to be something similar. And he came out with his white suit on. And all you heard from the band was... Oh, was yeah, I got cat whistle from all the... <laughs> you know, not, not just the girls, it was the fellas as well. <laughs> That's a bit worrying. You know, <laughs> no, but, uh, yeah, that, that was that's really funny. right. But also, uh, yeah, know, uh, when the core drums came together and came around you, it was like it was like your like somebody. It was a, a term that I mentioned was like Nico's bodyguards. So that's what was mentioned, and it was all these core drums just wrapped around your your protective ring, and it was it was just great. And there's some great photographs of that. So they're, they're my two mm -hmm. favorite memories, just from from that side of it that I'll, I'll remember. Yeah. I, like. I, I wish I, I, you know, you, you know, in hindsight or retrospectively, I was thinking, you know, I wish my hand was more, you know, you know, like when we did the trooper, you know, I wanted to so badly to play that feel at the beginning of the song, because it's, it's the iconic, one of those, those, you know, iconic feels that people want to hear that, that, let the, you know, that, that, you know, uh, and then the drum feel leading into the into the uh, the uh, the main groove, and you know, I I was so relieved that I could actually be that I was a part of it still. You know what I mean? Although I, you know, I did, this is what I was saying to you where I had to change up. You know, bat bat, but to go about that. That's the sort of feel I play to get into it. You know. Uh, but, you know, it, it was just, it's, it was incredible. I, I was, you know, when all those guys came down the stairs, I'm playing like this, looking at them, and I'll see them. Because it's hard for me to go like this and turn around and look to the right, you know. Um, but, uh, oh, my Lord, it was, um, that was, a, that was a, an amazing, I mean, even in a dress rehearsal, I mean, you know, it, there's no pressure on you. But when you're doing the show, you've got the audience out there and you know mm. that, that this is your time to perform. It, when you're doing a run through, you can make a mistake or two. It doesn't. It, it's still going to make an effect. Anyway, they came down that stairway, and I was like, "Holy, look at these guys!" This is just so <laughs> I know. And, uh, uh, and then, they, as you say, they they surrounded me, and the actual sound of of them, them to collectively playing, especially in in Run to the Hills, that da 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 da, you know, and, and that that really helped me because I'm supposed to be I'm supposed to put the accent on the symbol. That bit of gap, mm. that bit of gap, right? And it's hard for me to get that speed to get up there. And uh, I was like, that bit of gap. And it, they just, it was just immense. You know? Yeah, yeah, it, incredible. It was, it was a fantastic show. And, you know, I think what we need next, Nico, is Iron Maiden, the Marines do a symphonic album. I think that'd be, that'd be incredible. Oh, but my gosh. I'll leave that with well, you. Well, <laughs> when, we, when we finished the, the performance, 
on the Saturday night. I remember going in and meeting all the all the drum corps, and um, and uh, I said to them, "If you're available, and we're doing a British date, which we will do next year, uh, we can." I said, "Would you all be up for coming out and having a knock?" And they were like, "Yes, of course <laughs> we would." So I, I, I I'm going to when I get to rehearsals in August with the guys, I'm going to mention to them that. I mean, because Bruce came to the first show and was blown away. Mark, Mark the guitar player, and the uh, the other young man, I forget his name. Um, they shone. That both of those guitar players, oh, the whole orchestra shone. But the, the guitar player, I said, I said to Ian, "Can we get the guy to come up and stand next to the guitar players? Come down on the riser with me." But of course, that that Ian, he said, "Why?" I said, "Well, they need to be featured." You know. <laughs> Yeah. They, you know, yeah. they're that good. And he said, well, well, get them to stand up. We'll put a spotlight on them. And I said, because, you know, they, you couldn't get because you've got pedals and stuff to use yeah. and stuff like that. You know, it would have been a nice idea if they could have walked down and done their bit with us. But he said, oh, we're getting to stand up. And that, that was so good. And Bruce saw that and he said, those guitar players. He said, Nick, it was brilliant. Oh, I'm really proud of it. And I was like, I was a hero for Bruce, you know. <laughs> Um, so I think that with with that, I mean, could, you know, they could come up and do 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 a, you know, for, for on the encore, whatever we do, be great or have them just as a special guest, the marine, you know, the core of the marines, you know, yeah. that, that'd be yeah. wicked, wouldn't it? Amazing, amazing. I'm gonna hop to the last question, and we'll wrap yeah. up here as well. I know you have, we have some uh, you have an important uh, appointment to make. So if you were to have a quote or some advice that you live your life by or you would want to share with other people, what, what would just be some, some words of wisdom that you could share with the audience? Words of wisdom. Uh, keep the faith. And that is um, in whatever God you have. I happen to believe in my faith is Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit. Um, keep the faith. Drummers, keep practicing um, and... If you have adversity, never give up because it is it is within everybody's soul to be able to make the best of what you're given and what you've got. And uh, I am proof of that because I have overcome what I really thought was the end of my career. Uh, so I would suggest anybody, you know, that's feeling a little bit of pain at the minute, don't give up. Keep the faith. And just persevere and keep going because you can do it. I love it. I love it. Stu, any final thoughts? No, no. I mean, this is, you know, this this podcast has gone exactly how I thought it would do. I knew we wouldn't get through all the questions because I know what Nico's like, but, you know. What's <laughs> <laughs> that then, Stu? You can tell me now on my face. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, it's been great, Nico. Well, if you want to do a part two of this, I know I, I know it, I came in and late, and my my sincerest apologies for for being tardy on that. Um, but I do need to get going. Yeah, I've got I've got a few minutes. Uh, you know, it takes me half an hour normally to get to the, the the appointment, but I can put my foot down a bit. No, it's okay. <laughs> we we just. Speak. But thank you so very much, Mark. It's a it's lovely to see you again. And if you want to catch up with some more uh, questions later on, we can do it. We can do it again. I really appreciate that. It's been fantastic. And I, I adore your story, your perseverance, your words of wisdom. And I think a lot of people can learn and listen from the excellence that you bring to the table, the challenges that you've experienced in your life, and honestly, how you've overcome them. And you just are, Nico, you're an, such an inspiration. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. God bless you, Mark, and you, Stu, and everybody out there. Thank you so very much, and uh, we'll see you again soon. Okay? Sounds great. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Bye. Hey, everyone. This is Mark Riley again. We want to share a great opportunity with you to get your business name out to our listeners. We are looking for individual episode and yearly sponsors for the Washington Tattoo Podcast. So if you love music, history, and want to support military veterans, please take this step with us and consider being a sponsor. For information on that, please email marketing at thewashingtontattoo.com. This message is from the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs. For TSAs on the best services available to veterans, go to VA's new radio outreach page, news.va.gov 
slash outreach slash radio.